Good morning, and welcome to worship at Northminster on this first Sunday in April. We are so thrilled to have all of you here with us, whether you're with us in person or joining us on the live stream. On this, our first Sunday of moving to mask optional for worship, we are so thrilled to have as many folks here with us as we can. And on this particular day, as we continue our Lenten journey, considering the theme of full to the brim, we consider the presence of beauty, beauty as an act of resistance against all that is not beautiful. So those who have been made beautiful, those who have been called to be bearers of beauty, let us worship God together this day. Good morning. Good morning. I invite you to stand as you feel called and as you're able and join me in our call to worship. Friends, may we find courage here. Courage, courage to follow our call. Courage to live out our faith. May we find hope here. Hope, hope for a better world. Hope, hope that refuses to let us go. May we find truth here. Truth, truth that, that lives in sacred community. Truth, truth that, that lives in ancient stories. May we find all we seek. 
and in and our seeking, may you know God. Amen. God, we are grateful to gather in your name this day. We are grateful for the shining sun streaming through the windows and the people around us. We are grateful to have this time and space to worship you, to talk to you, to be moved by you. Clear our heads and open our hearts that your word and way might find a home within them. Extravagant God, lavishing your love on the poverty of our heart, inspire us to give with generosity, to love life so that we may find it again, and thus the world be filled with the fragrance of your love through Jesus Christ, who offers himself for us. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you now to say with me an acknowledgement of our need of grace. Jesus of Nazareth, we admit that we often tuck our faith into our pockets, hiding in a place of comfort rather than proudly declaring, yes, we are Christian, yes, we believe, yes, this faith has changed me. We are so vain of offending others or embarrassing ourselves that we have established rules. No faith in different people. No faith in politics. No faith with strangers. Forgive us for whispering when we could be singing. Forgive us for staying quiet when we could be part of rewriting the narrative. We want to be brave. We want, we want to pour, to pour out perfume over your feet. feet. These, These things we pray. Amen. Amen. Family of faith, hear this good news. Even in our silence, God, God loves, loves us. us. Even in our fear or shame, God, God chooses us. us. We are free to be bold, to be brazen, to be, to be exactly, exactly who God, God called us to be. be. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now I invite you to stand as you feel called and are able, and with joy and the assurance of God's love and God's peace, a peace that is given to us 
that passes all understanding, let us pass this peace with one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Please keep our protocols as well. Peace of Christ be with you. Oh my. noticed children of all ages when I came back up I brought a couple jugs with me uh, I want to talk to you today about water see I've got my gallon here it's empty actually because I couldn't find the lid in the recycling bin and I wanted to save some water <laughs> but imagine this were it full of water so we've got this one and then we've got this which is filled with water so you can see the line so it's at the two quart mark all right, so we're going to be talking about water, but first, I want you to hear from the writings of Prophet Isaiah. This is from the reading that I'm going to be uh, sharing before the sermon in just a few minutes. It's about a promise that God gives to us. So l listen, listen closely and think about what you hear about water. For I am about to do a new thing. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness for my people to come home. I will create rivers for them in the desert. The wild animals in the field will thank me, the jackals and the ostriches too, for giving them water in the wilderness. Yes, I will make springs in the desert so that my chosen people can be refreshed. Throughout the Bible, God offers water to people as a gift, as something that is essential, as something that they, they can't create, but that is given. It is God's promise to them to bring them life. Water is very important to God and God's people and is always used for a purpose. I am sure in Sunday school you have read many stories about uh, Jesus using water to heal, to baptize in the Old Testament, Noah and the ark, spending so many days on the water. Water is everywhere in the Bible, from the first chapter of Genesis and the creation of water, which God saw as good. God is good. But for us today, it's pretty easy to take God's gift of water for granted. To not even think about it as a gift, but just something that we have when we turn on the faucet. Especially living so close to Lake Michigan, we can forget that many people don't have water to drink or to take showers or to wash their hands. Some people don't even have water within a 30-minute walk. Lots of people. Did you know that around the world, Many people only have access to the amount of water each day that we Americans use in one toilet flush. So, now there are water efficient toilets. So, some are like 1.28 gallons and some are like 1.6 gallons. But roughly speaking, one toilet flush is this full milk jug with water and then this much water. That's it for the whole day. That's it. All right, well, might be interesting for you to learn that in the same day, Americans waste up to 30 gallons of water in one day. 30 of these jugs. Now, some of this waste comes from things that we can't uh, control on a daily basis, things like um, old pipes, leaky faucets. Um, in the summertime, the times that you water the lawn or the number of times. There are lots of different ways that water can be um, wasted in, in ways that we can't, that we don't think about or as kids you're not even really, you don't have anything to do with. But there are some ways that we all can control how much water we use. Now I know that you've heard these things before, 
But I'm going to tell you again because today is April 3rd, which is the beginning of Earth Month. And since it's the beginning of Earth Month, I'm hoping that you will take a challenge that I offer, which is to pay attention to how much water you're using, to pay attention to how long your showers are. Did you know that if you make your shower two minutes shorter, you can even like set a timer on a, on a phone or wherever and try to make it two minutes shorter, you save 10 gallons. That's a quick 10 gallons saved. And do you know how much water you waste when you're brushing your teeth and you just let it run? You're not thinking about it. You turn it on, you wet your toothbrush, and then you brush your teeth. Well, that water is running and not doing anything. So turn it off. Again, things we know. Even when you're washing your hands, you can turn off the water while you are doing the washing. These things make a big difference. And in any of you who cook, kids and adults, when if you're making dinners, Try to make one pot dinners, so then you don't have to spend as much time doing dishes. You also don't have to use as much water. So this month, I invite you to think about all of these things and to, in trying to waste less water, be more aware of the gift that water is from God and say a quick thank you prayer. Even a quick thank you prayer after you go to the bathroom. Thank you, Lord, for water. Let's pray. God, thank you for the gift of water, for the gift of life. We are sorry that we take it for granted and that we waste it. Help us to change our habits and become more aware of how much we use this gift each and every day. We pray for those in the world that don't have water to drink and to clean with, and for those that are working so that all people might have the water they need. We love you, Lord. Amen. Now I invite children to go, children and youth to go to Sunday school. Friends, I invite you to pray with me our prayer for illumination. Holy God, sometimes our waking is a prayer. 
Sometimes the song we have stuck in our head, rumbling around on repeat, is a prayer. Sometimes the way we lift our phones to capture an image of the sunset or of people we love, that is a prayer. Other times, there is moments like this, heads bowed, eyes closed, hearts quiet for just a moment, and in all of it, we trust you to hear us, help us to you in turn, gratefully we pray. As I mentioned in our children's sermon just a minute ago, our first reading for this morning comes to us from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 16 through 21. I invite you to hear again these words. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. Our second reading today comes to us from the Gospel of John, from the 12th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Let us hear this familiar story with fresh ears today. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, to the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is a scene that is at the same time iconic and a little bit ridiculous. It's the most remembered part of the Academy Award-winning and now deeply anachronistic end of the last century film, American Beauty. The movie now kind of makes our skin crawl with its middle-aged white cisgender protagonist, played by now disgraced actor Kevin Spacey, having a midlife crisis because of a teenager next door. The scene that is most remembered, though, involves two other angst-ridden teenagers watching a video of a plastic shopping bag swirling in the wind. The young man who filmed it narrates the scene. Do you want to see the most beautiful thing I've ever filmed? It was one of those days when it's a minute away from snowing. And there's this electricity in the air. You can almost hear it, right? And this bag was just dancing with me, like a little kid begging me to play with it for 15 minutes. That's the day I realized that there was this entire life behind things and this incredibly benevolent force that wanted me to know that there was no reason to be afraid, ever. This video is a poor excuse, I know, but it helps me remember. I need to remember. Sometimes there's so much beauty in the world, I feel like I can't take it, and my heart is just going to cave in. 
Admittedly, it is now one of the most parodied scenes in modern movie history, but despite its far too serious tone, it does speak a word of truth. That if we are willing to look for it, the world is filled with beauty. Beauty we create, beauty God creates, and beauty that seems like the bag in the breeze to be a collaboration between humanity and the divine. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary says that beauty is the quality or aggregate of qualities in a person or thing that gives pleasure to the senses or pleasurably exalts the mind or spirit. Today we encounter John's reimagining of event presented very differently in the Gospel of Mark. There, an unnamed woman in the household of Simon breaks open a jar of fragrant spices used to anoint dead bodies for burial and anoints Jesus' head. When the protests come, as they do here, Jesus gives a much more detailed explanation of how this is a pre-anointing him for his death to come. Here, still in Bethany, one thing they have in common, the woman is named, and she has one of the most powerful backstories in John's Gospel. This is but one chapter after Jesus has brought her brother Lazarus back from the dead, and by anointing his feet instead of his head, her act is not simply symbolic. It seems almost to be a teaching moment. One chapter later, Jesus will place himself in that same position and wash the feet of his disciples. Mary engages in a defiant act of beauty. The room is filled with the rich aromas of nard, very expensive perfume. Feet that have been made unclean by weeks of the journey toward Jerusalem. Bethany's just outside of Jerusalem. Those feet are cherished. The sight of her act of devotion, the scent of the spices, the conclusion of this last time anyone is depicted as being hospitable to Jesus. First with Martha's meal and now with Mary's anointing. All of it fits that Merriam-Webster definition to a T, not just because it's pleasurable to the senses, but because there's something about it that exalts the mind and spirit. After all, there is much ugliness to come for Jesus and his followers, but here, in her household, Mary will create a moment of beauty, and Jesus will see it as what she offers it to be, not as something wasteful. He won't just view the events intellectually or with price tags in his head, but he will see beyond a purely logical interpretation of events. You know, when we think about it, beauty is rarely logical. But then one could say the same thing about love or grace or resurrection hope. Opening ourselves to the vulnerability of seeing beauty that is already there, or creating beauty, is sometimes a defiant act of illogical hope. Maybe that's why we groan now at the flying bag scene from American Beauty. It it seems indulgent or silly. It's, It's kind of too much. But then maybe that's the point. The love that will be on display over the next two weeks of Jesus' journey into Jerusalem, into the temple with its table-turning righteous anger, to the Passover meal on Holy Thursday and the crucifixion on Friday, and then the world-shattering resurrection on Easter. They are all too much. They aren't logical. But there is a beauty there. The soul is stirred by a love that deep by Jesus' self-sacrifice, by Mother Mary's heartbreaking constancy, by Mary Magdalene's fear-defying insistence to prepare his body, by God's death-defying actions that are still shrouded in mystery. It's all too much. And at the same time, it's all so beautiful that we feel we can't take it, that if it's true, our hearts are just going to cave in. Today we celebrate extravagant, abundant beauty in Mary's act, not simply because of the loving care she showed, but how it shapes all that is coming. As I noted, surely when he takes up his towel and bowl a week later, Jesus remembers Mary's actions. 
Maybe she inspires that action in the first place. When they next take Nard to a tomb they don't yet know is empty, surely the women are remembering that last time his body was anointed. That John remembers Mary's act this way, as the defiant act of beauty that will echo across the next fortnight of world-changing acts of ugliness and beauty, is itself remarkable. A woman, an unmarried woman with no social position or power, seems to set the scene for the greatest story ever told. It all begs the question, where are we letting beauty in? Where are we creating beauty as both an antidote to the world's ugliness that has been or will be, but also as acts of defiant hope and of faith lived? Letting beauty in is what makes that dancing shopping bag worth looking at again. Letting beauty in requires that we slow down, that we raise our eyes from our phones or our plans or our disappointments and be fully present where we are. It allows us to see something new and remarkable or something we've noticed a thousand times but never really seen. Maybe like the carvings on the ends of every pew, inviting us to think about what they depict, who carved them, what the artist was thinking when the wheat or the poppy or the Bible were carved. Or maybe it notices the way the sun dances on the faces of children as they walk past the stained glass windows to Sunday school. Or maybe it notices the casual but caring helping hand the crossing guard in my neighborhood gives the elderly neighbor who navigates the busy intersection at Ridge and Main every day as she heads to the Sure Main Grill for breakfast. Letting beauty in is a defiant act of hope because it interrupts our busyness of preparing for what may happen eventually to see what is actually happening right now. Taking even more time to create moments of beauty from simple colored cranes dangling from a church ceiling to weeks in the making in the stunning art of David Darcy's pieces that are gracing our tower gallery until Pentecost to the late night conversations or early morning greetings exchanged between volunteers and guests at the overnight shelter. Like Mary's time at Jesus' feet, all of these moments where we intentionally set out and maybe accidentally create beauty, all of these point us to the world that can be and carry us through the moments of ugliness and sorrow. And sometimes they can even transform that sorrow. It's called The Birds of America. Pretty simple. The collection of colored drawings created from 1827 to 1838 of 435 different species of bird by John James Audubon. He first fell in love with American birds when his father sent him from France to a family-owned farm in Pennsylvania to prevent him from being drafted into Napoleon's army. His love and interest in American nature, and particularly birds, grew. And as he began to draw, he discovered something, something that would become foundational for him. Drawings and paintings of captured and killed birds just couldn't compare to those he could create by encountering the birds alive in their habitats. And so that is how he painted. His crowning achievement literally created the ornithological movement in the United States. In 1905, naturalists realized that several of his species captured in those beautiful works were already gone. And so they took his name when they formed the now longest lasting environmental nonprofit in the United States, the Audubon Society. Their sad reflection on these beautiful birds lost to history except in his inspired drawings inspired them to preserve and protect first just birds and now wildlife in general. From the artist's captured natural beauty of birds, a nation's responsibility to care for them was born. His creation of beauty, including the now six extinct species found in the book, has inspired actions that have saved dozens more from extinction. 
But it's not just aesthetic beauty that can change us or change the future. If you visit the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, a museum that chronicles the legacy of oppression of black people in our country, you will encounter an odd little exhibit. It's a series of shelves lined with jars about this big. Each jar is filled with dirt. Jars of earth. And on each jar is a name or a collection of names. The soil in each jar was collected by volunteers from across the United States from the sites of lynchings of black Americans. It would be hard to call that exhibit beautiful. Profound, yes. But there is at least one moment of beauty found in its creation. Museum Executive Director Byron Stevenson, Brian Stevenson told this story in a recent interview with John Stewart. One of their volunteers, a middle-aged black woman, had traveled to a fairly remote spot on a county road, a little more than a half hour outside of Montgomery. She had her jar from the museum, and she had a printout describing the location and the lynching of the young black man. She had just settled herself onto the ground and dug the trowel into the ground to start breaking up the earth when a truck drove by and then stopped and backed up. She froze in fear. Inside the truck, a white man in his late thirties, a big man, she remembers. And she began to think, what am I gonna do? I'm out here all alone. What can I say to him? And sure enough, he got out of the truck and approached her and asked what she was doing. She was going to lie say that she was there to just collect dirt for a planting that she was going to be doing. But something told her to just tell the truth. So she did. He looked at her silently for a few moments and asked, is that paper about the lynching? She nodded. Can I read it? She passed it up to him. After he had looked at it for a few minutes, he lifted his eyes to hers. Ma'am, he asked, can I help you do this? She said yes, and he knelt beside her. She offered the trowel, and he said, no, no, ma'am. I need to do this with my hands. And she says he began to tear at the ground, breaking it up and lifting it into the jar as she did the same with her trowel. His willingness to help her brought a tear to her eye, and she said she looked at his face bright red by that point, and suddenly his shoulders were shaking, and tears came for him. Are you all right? She said, reaching out to touch him. And he shook his head. Ma'am, I just can't help wondering if my grandfather was one of the men who was here that day. She placed her hand on his. They finished filling the jar, and then the two of them together drove all the way back to Montgomery to deliver the jar together. This soul-stirringly beautiful moment of vulnerability and honesty hasn't solved the racial divides of Alabama. But it has created a spring of new water. It is a new thing for a new day, creating space for new conversations to happen. It has broken open hearts and minds that were closed before, created a spring from which so many will drink in the future, so that people might be changed by the shared experience of this beautiful encounter. Defiant acts of beauty can break down barriers we thought were impenetrable from graffiti on the Berlin Wall to a roadside in Alabama to sweet spices on a weary rabbi's feet. Defiant acts of beauty can set a new course for a day, an hour, or a lifetime. And maybe they are so faithful because they mirror what God is doing for us and with us all the time. With the coming of the spring, we see it every day if we look. 
the overwhelming beauty of a sunrise over the lake, the unique beauty of every newborn child, the stunning beauty and diversity of humanity and all the other creatures of the universe. All around us, beauty is calling to us, pointing the way to the future, declaring God's undying love for humanity and for all of creation. And so may it change us. May it inspire us and lead us to more and more moments of recognizing and creating extravagant, maybe even wasteful moments of beauty for ourselves and for all the world until all of us can see and feel the love offered to us by this entire life behind all things. This incredibly benevolent force that wants us to know there is no reason to be afraid. May God make it so, in us, through us, and if need be, in spite of us. Amen. Again, a warm welcome to you this day. We're so glad that you've joined us, either in person or on the live stream, for this final Lenten Sunday before we move into Holy Week. This morning, directly following worship, you are invited and encouraged to make your way to the bottom of the tower entrance for our coffee hour. Along the walls, you'll notice the beautiful oil paintings of artist David Darcy, as Michael referred to. Um, in his sermon just a few moments ago. Darcy's exhibit, Sacred Spaces, opens today and will run through the end of May. Darcy explains his work. My paintings and drawings are motivated by my experiences in nature. The images come from my walks in the woods and travels I have taken and begin with quick studies or photos. My work immerses the viewer in nature often focusing on the quiet or solitude of a certain place. I am particularly drawn to the subtle interplay of light and color unique to that place. The rhythms of shapes help me to determine a way through the space in the works, much as I experience on my walks. As you look at the paintings, you'll notice many familiar locations near us. We are grateful to the work of the Music, Worship, and Arts Committee, especially to Jackie Eddy, for bringing this exhibit to us. Also, in your bulletin, you will notice uh, there is, again, this blue sheet. Easter is coming, and uh, so too are the Easter lilies, uh, but the time to order them is becoming short. Uh, Orders are due by a week from tomorrow, which is April 11th. Uh, Take a moment and fill out this sheet, and then you can put it in the basket in the office uh, labeled Easter Lilies. Um, You are encouraged to to do that um, at your earliest convenience. Uh, Some of the other things that are happening um, at church this week, we have our uh, prayers that will be Tuesday and Thursday morning at 9 a.m., and we, by, by a Zoom, excuse me, and we will have our final Lenten worship, which will be on Thursday, August 6th at 7 p.m. Friends, I invite you to review the Northminster notes. There's so much going on. Um, I will highlight, um, and this is something for the parents as well, um, on next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday, we will be having the um, Palm Parade. So those of you with with children are invited to come to church a little early and, um, excuse me, go to basement rooms one and two at 920. But also this Sunday, this coming Sunday, um, a week from today, uh, the F, the refugee uh, task force invites families to gather um, any items that you might have for the refugee families um, to donate to please bring those on Sunday. And those of you who are, um, 
not with children or children in the program are invited to do so too. Let's have a big, uh, a big offering, a uh, big collection for this uh, large family, <laughs> this family of nine that needs uh, many things. And um, if you want to know more about that, you can um, look on the Wednesday email and you'll find a link to the Sign Up Genius that tell, tells you which items are most in need. Um, the other things I invite you to review and as we move into um, communion and to our offering, uh, be mindful of all of the gifts that have been given to you by God and the ways that you might um, offer thanksgiving through your time, through your financial resources, through your prayers. Um, you are the church for which we are grateful.
may be seated. Friends, Jesus has always been the one to invite. He said, drop your nets and follow me. He said, let the children come. He said, stand up from your mat, for you are healed. Jesus has always been one to invite, and that hasn't changed. So friends, you are invited to this table. Each and every one of us with our doubts and our fears, our scars and our joys, our dreams, our hopes, our questions. All of that, all of us, are welcomed at Christ's table. And here we will be met. Here we will be fed. Here we are given a taste of an expansive life that is full to the brim with love and overflowing with joy. So come, not because you must, but because you can. Come, you are invited. This table is for you. God who knows us. We are amazed by you. Your love never runs out. Your hope never runs dry. Your joy never gives up. We wish that we could be more like you in that way, O oh God. In a world that loves scarcity, your abundance is shocking. In a world that knows fear, your joy is compelling. In a world that knows anxiety, your peace is captivating. We long for these things. So today, we ask you, be with us on the hamster wheel of the daily grind. Be with us when compassion fatigue rears her head. Be with us when stress makes it hard to breathe. Be with us when self-doubt pushes in close. Be with us when exhaustion becomes constant or when loneliness becomes our primary language. Be with us and show us the way to the life you long for us. Show us a life of expansive faith. Show us a life of overflowing joy. Show us a life of absorbing beauty. Show us a life of engrossing purpose. Show us a life that is as honest and wondrous and meaningful as the one Jesus led. And until that expansive and holy day, we will continue to gather at this table, God. Until that day, we will continue to look for you in our midst. So pour out a double portion of yourself onto this bread and cup so that we might catch a glimpse of your goodness. God, indeed, we are amazed by you. Your love never runs out. So bring that never-ending love here as we pray again as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In an upstairs room with his friends, after giving thanks for it, he took bread and he broke it, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Later that night, he took the cup, he poured it, blessed it, and offered it to them, saying, Take and drink, for this is my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us, each time we do take of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim Christ's death and resurrection until he comes again. Friends, today as we gather for communion, we continue with the communion structure that we have used for the last several months. You'll be invited to come forward down the center aisle. Jessica and I will each hand you a piece of bread, and you're invited to then go to one of the trays as you pass by us and take both the bread and the cup back to your seat. As you take your seat, you're invited to take the bread, and then we will all join. Once all have been fed, we will all drink the cup together. Friends, come, for the feast is prepared for us all.
Let us drink deep of the grace of God. We've all been fed. And let us pray. Holy One, you invite us here to be fed and to follow. In the bread, we have been nourished for the work you set before us. In the cup, we have tasted joy you would have, for, have us to share with a world parched by despair. Inspire us and transform our gratitude into prayer and labor in your service and to your glory. Amen. And so now we prepare to go out into a world, a world where there is more beauty there than we can imagine, where we are invited to lift our eyes to see it and to look down to our hands, to see the ways that we are invited to be co-creators of that beauty with one another and with the God who sends us, knowing that that God is ever above us, watching over us, ever beneath us to lift us up when times grow hard, traveling before us to show us the way to go, behind us to push us into places we might not otherwise go, but also alongside us so that we might know that we are never alone. And all God's people said, 